Hey folks, author MJ Gallagher here and welcome back to Rebirth Revealed, a video series presented and funded by Coupocon, in which I highlight some of the less obvious details and easter eggs you may have missed in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. This episode covers the main story content of Chapter 2, A New Journey Begins. Spoilers beyond this part of the game are minimal, but please beware of likely spoilers for the original Final Fantasy VII, its remake, and the compilation in general. Without further delay, let's hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and mosey on in. One of the biggest questions fans had following the climax of Final Fantasy VII Remake was whether Cloud and the others had emerged from the singularity on the same plane of existence as Zack, who seems to have somehow survived the Shinra army's onslaught and is now on a different path. This is suggested by the radio broadcast when Cloud enters the lobby of the inn at Calm, which, of course, matches the news report from the game's opening. However, the presence of the Beagle-style stamp artwork on the drinks cart outside the tavern verifies that our heroes are in a separate time and space, because the stamp shown on the billboard in Zack's Midgar was the same terrier-style mascot that appears on the chip bag at the end of Remake. This is reaffirmed by the copies of Stamp and the Hidden Treasure on a magazine stand near the clock tower, the cover of which, as in Remake, evokes comparisons to the Temple of the Ancients. We know from the giant advertisement in Wall Market in the previous game that the pyramid in the artwork is accompanied by mystical spheres and a star constellation, not unlike the menu screen in Rebirth. Furthermore, if you return to the inn later in the chapter, the doll collector is also holding a beagle stamp. Like most towns in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Calm is presented as a living, breathing municipality, with its own history and quirks. Having said that, many of the fun little details dotted around are callbacks to Remake or other titles in the compilation. For example, in the lane behind the tavern, two men are discussing a recent trip one of them took to Midgar. He says a blonde dude slayed the stage at the Honeybee Inn, but was then beaten and sent to Don Corneo's place. This of course is a reference to Cloud dancing with Andrea Rodea during the mall market scenario, although the circumstances of how he made it into Corneo's mansion are slightly misinformed. At a nearby cafe is a guy reminiscing over the heavenly steamed buns filled with minced meat that he used to buy every day in Sector 8. He also makes mention of a girl who worked there and wonders if she's still selling them. Those who've read the official novel Traces of Two Pasts or played the associated mini chapter in the mobile game Ever Crisis may have realised that he's talking about Tifa, who worked for years on a steamed buns cart in the Sector 8 slums to repay her medical debts. Incidentally, this is how she first met Biggs, Wedge and Jesse. There's also a journalist writing an article about the men in black robes. He says most people agree they're suffering from acute Mako poisoning, but some theorise they're victims of secret experimentation by Shinra. This is a bit of foreshadowing, but also an allusion to Kazushige no Jima's short story Picturing the Past, which was originally published as part of Remake's world preview book. In summary, a number of the robed figures are former soldiers, while others are those who volunteered for President Shinra's special survey units around 15 years ago. They were sent to locate remote areas of the planet believed to be rich in Mako, and many who returned were afflicted by serious Mako poisoning. They were thereafter treated at Hojo's laboratory in Shinra headquarters, and are implied to have been infused with Genova cells. These individuals are separate to the survivors of the Nibelheim tragedy in the old game, but I'll return to this point later in the series. Speaking of Nibelheim, there's a poster on the wall of the cafe advertising that the Cowboys Chocobo Racing Team is returning to the village. This was also seen in Cloud's flashback during Chapter 1, but its placement here is curious. As far as Cloud and Tifa know, their hometown no longer exists. Elsewhere around Cam, you can find a boy with a wooden buster sword, which is a callback to the orphans of the Sector 5 Leaf House in Remake, a dolphin ornament and two 135th scale soldiers at a trinket stall, which is probably a reference to the upcoming Junon scenario, 
a haggard old man claiming to be a former supervisor of Shinra's Space and Aeronautics Division who likely lost his job after the failure of Sid Hywin's rocket launch, and a young Queen's Blood player called Nene, who speaks to Cloud via her stuffed animal, Mr Cuddlesworth. This may be rather alarming to anyone who played Remake, because Mr Cuddlesworth dolls are explosives that can be purchased from the souvenir shop at the Corneo Coliseum. Meanwhile, the same doll collector I mentioned before has ambitions to obtain the souvenir shop's other cutesy explosive, Fuzzy Wuzzy. As a side note, among the selection of iconic Final Fantasy creatures the man is carrying are a ghost from the train graveyard and a fat moogle akin to the one ridden by Kate Sith. On the subject of dubious companions, the Cactuar in Makotank Plaza may be a nod to Crisis Core. Eavesdropping on the nearby conversation will reveal that the creature is actually the pet of one of the ladies. During Crisis Core there is a trio of soldier missions in which Zack is sent into the wastelands between Midgar and Calm to hunt down the pet Cactuar of a Shinra executive. It turns out the prickly devil has stolen classified information and completion of the missions will add Cactuar to Zack's digital mindwave. In one corner of the map, a vending machine selling Benora White apple juice can be found right next to a poster for the play Loveless. While both are frequently advertised in Remake, they are most closely associated with Crisis Core and its antagonist, Genesis. At the Rusty Arrow Bar, you can chat to Barrett about him not having another drink until 7th Heaven is back up and running. This follows on from Remake's Chapter 15, where Cloud, Barrett and Tifa promise each other that they'll rebuild the bar, which, in turn, is a reference to the 7th Heaven in Edge that appears in Advent Children on the way to a smile and other compilation titles. Barrett is also eating pizza here, a likely nod to the recurring metaphor of Midgar being like a rotting pizza, or perhaps that pizza is one of the promoted meals at 7th Heaven. And in case that wasn't enough, the guy beside Barrett at the bar has bought his date a Cosmo Canyon cocktail, which he claims symbolises the guiding star of destiny. In Chapter 3 of Remake, Tifa, known affectionately as the Star of 7th Heaven, makes Cloud the same cocktail, though I'll come back to this in the next episode. As in the original Final Fantasy VII, it's common for some of the actions or dialogue of certain NPCs to change should you return to Calm at a later point in the story. Perhaps the most obvious are the two brothers of the Singles Club. When first approached at the start of chapter 2, they are discussing a girl with a pink dress and ribbon in her hair, and another with a great physique. This is clearly a reference to Aerith and Tifa, but maybe also to the so-called love triangle that concerns their relationship with Cloud. Subsequent visits to the town will reveal the boys of the singles club expressing their emotions by channeling their inner elfadunk. Similarly, the father of Akira, the singer encountered at Drunkard's Bar in Wall Market during Remake initially talks about his son moving to Midgar after a falling out and how he managed to track down one of his music discs. That same disc, called the Midgar Blues, can be obtained in Remake to play on the jukeboxes and is handed to Cloud by Akira himself. Once the party has regained access to come, Akira can be found performing on the stage behind his father. Cloud will even pause to clap along. There are also two female friends that have been dating the same guy, which seems to continue a conversation from Remake. Here, one of them lets slip that she knew all along, causing an argument. If you return to the spot later in Chapter 2, the women will be actively slapping one another, but will have resolved their dispute by the time Cloud and Co have made it to Junon. They even suggest going on a date at the Gold Saucer alluding to the character relationship mechanics in both the old Final Fantasy VII and Rebirth. My personal favourite of all the evolving NPC comments is the man reading lines from his theatre production. I am Baron Kylegate. Behold the towering wall that I have built. The future of Calm is bright indeed. This is a reference to the Shinra chapter in the official novel On the Way to a Smile in which Rufus finds himself locked up in the basement of Kyle Gate Villa. According to Verdot, the former chief of the Turks and once a resident of Calm, the Kyle Gates had been an affluent family. 
The performer's script, therefore, suggests their wealth is associated with the fortification of the town. As it happens, the man responsible for Rufus's kidnapping in the book is Mutant Kylegate, a lieutenant in the Junon military. If you return here in chapter 4 onwards, the play's lines will have changed, and Mutant himself gets name dropped. What's even more interesting is that On the Way to a Smile describes the residence in Calm from which Rufus was taken, while he was recovering from injuries sustained during the Diamond Weapons attack on Midgar. It's said to be a modest two-storey house owned by the Shinra company, with a good view of the town streets. I wonder then if that's why the residence around the corner from the performer is the only one in Calm to have a Shinra crest above the door. Outside the original Final Fantasy VII, the title in which Calm features most prominently is Dirge of Cerberus. In fact, the entire first chapter of that game is set in the town. Rebirth seems to pay homage to Dirge of Cerberus by including a number of little details from its opening sequence. For example, based on the window overlooking Makotank Plaza, Vincent is initially shown sitting on what appears to be the same bed that Cloud sleeps in, and is listening to a TV news report about activity in Midgar. Similarly, as I mentioned earlier, the radio broadcast that plays when Cloud enters the inn's lobby is a word-for-word -word repeat of the televised report at the opening of Rebirth, which also concerns the city. According to the Dirge of Cerberus Complete Guide, the celebrations taking place in Calm while Vincent is there relate to the Revival Festival, itself in recognition of the worldwide network, i.e. the internet, being restored. There's a parade of female dancers, who are performing in a street lined with market stalls selling food and drink, as well as focus on a young girl, whose name is Rio, carrying a Moogle doll. It's therefore unlikely to be a coincidence that Cloud can find a dance group practicing for the forthcoming Harvest Festival, or a marketplace filled with various types of fresh food, drinks and items, including, you guessed it, a stall with a Moogle doll. As for the Harvest Festival itself, I have much more to say on that, but I'll wait until next time to provide proper context. Arguably the most on-the-nose visual reference to Dirge of Cerberus is the manner in which the Shinra aircraft unexpectedly appear above the town, swooping past the clock tower as Cloud and Aerith watch on. This reflects the Dragonfly helicopters of Deep Ground, who use similar manoeuvres. Additionally, the Shinra troopers parachuting and sliding down ropes into the streets of frightened denizens resemble the Deep Ground soldiers being deployed on wires from the Dragonflies and scattering the crowds. Cloud and Aerith quickly make their way back down the clock tower, and are intercepted by Broden, proprietor of the inn at Calm, and a man who claims to have a history with Shinra. He insists on helping them escape, and his incentive for doing so is that he wants to avoid violence because the town has suffered enough. Although he doesn't elaborate on the specifics of this misery here, Broden leads the pair to an air raid shelter beneath the inn whose external doors could earlier be seen downstairs from the entrance to the Rusty Arrow. I spoke in the last episode about Chief Ferdo's revelation during Before Crisis that, several years ago, Calm had been bombed in error by the Shinra army, due to a miscommunication between himself and the military. Ferdo was present in the town square at the time, and his memory of the event includes the water tower being damaged. This particular detail is alluded to by the tour guide at the plaza in Rebirth, divulging that the current Mako tank was constructed to resemble the old Republic-era water tower. It also explains why there's an air raid shelter beneath it. As for Broden's personal connection to the tragedy, I'll come back to that next time. The grasslands region beyond the walls of Calm is the player's first proper taste of the open world zones in Rebirth, and a real step away from the relative linearity of Remake. There's actually so much to do here, and so many hidden in plain sight details, that they require a dedicated video. For now though, I'll be focusing on the main story only. En route to the swamp, the party can stumble upon Bill, owner of the nearby Chocobo Ranch. He greets them as his favourite group of hitchhikers, the reason for which may not be immediately obvious if the player hasn't completed Remake's episode intermission. During the epilogue of the DLC, Tifa, Aerith and Barrett 
flag belt down and he gives them a ride in this ferry truck for some of the journey between Midgar and Calm. Concluding that they need chocobos to cross the marshes, the company heads to the ranch, where they are introduced to Bill's grandson Billy. As in the original Final Fantasy VII, none of the birds in the stables are available for hire, so Billy sends them to locate and wrangle a runaway named Pico by following the chocobo tracks, which is how wild chocobos are encountered in the old game. Pico is appeased by feeding him Gisal greens. This is a callback to both Final Fantasy VII, where tossing greens to a chocobo in battle distracts them long enough to be caught, and to Chapter 14 of Remake, in which three of Chocobo Sam's birds flee from their stable hand after being frightened by the collapse of the Sector 7 plate, but are calmed when given the vegetables. Eagle-eyed fans may have spotted that Gisao greens in Final Fantasy VII were pale blue or jade in colour, not deep red as they appear in Remake and Rebirth. This colour better reflects the cracker greens in the original. Billy and his sister Chloe, whose name was mistranslated as Cole in the English localisation, play a small role in the old game, and are primarily involved in the chocobo breeding process. Little context is provided about their family situation, but the Ultimania Omega reveals that their parents died when they were young, although the circumstances of this are unclear. As Billy grew, he picked up his grandfather's profit-seeking habits, which is clearly evidenced through his businessman-like behaviour in Rebirth. What's especially interesting about this family dynamic is that Chloe's name has deeper meaning to it. The ancient Greek tale of Daphnis and Chloe is about a boy and girl who are abandoned by their respective parents at birth and raised by shepherds, just as the orphaned Billy and Chloe are raised by Chocobo Bill. This might be why the girl uses euphemisms for death, such as their parents left or are gone. Daphnis and Chloe eventually fall in love, which is quite separate to Final Fantasy VII's story of course, but an important part of their coming of age is seeking advice from a wise old cowherd. In the original game, Chloe compiles information gathered from the Chocobo Sage. Then Rebirth, well, I guess we'll come back to that. One of the new features that's been added to Rebirth is customisable riding gear for chocobos. At Chloe's shop, it's possible to purchase the helmet, breastplate and greaves used by Shinra's mounted units. What's curious about this is that there are no instances anywhere in the compilation where chocobo mounted troopers actually appear. That being said, at the old dock where the party first decides to go hire some birds is a weapon chest containing Cloud Sleek Sabre whose inventory screen describes it as a Republic-era blade. As it happens, sabres are swords that are most often associated with light cavalry, so the implication here is that Cloud himself is the mounted unit. On the topic of weapons, Aerith's timeless rod can be obtained from a chest at the ranch, and is said to have been carved from a millennia-old tree. It grants her the ability Chrono Aegis which can be loosely translated from Greek as Time Protection or Time Shield. These details might pique the interest of those who have played Rebirth as far as the Temple of the Ancients. Red 13, meanwhile, begins the game equipped with the Mithril Collar, which is described as being used for identification and was developed for test subjects in Hojo's lab. While I understand the premise, I would have thought the massive tattoo lasered onto his foreleg was identification enough. It's also worth noting that the ability associated with the Mithril Collar is Stardust Ray, which is a level 2 limit break for Red in the original Final Fantasy VII. This explains why he can be seen using the attack against the Whisper Harbinger during Chapter 18 of Remake. Before Cloud and the others head back to the Swamplands, Chadley presents himself to the group. Amid the conversation, he reminds them that he was created by Professor Hojo, and labels himself as a cyborg. This echoes his monologue in Remake if the player completes the top secrets trial of the combat simulator. The repeated use of Cyborg is intriguing however, because it suggests that part of Chadley is a human boy, rather than being entirely artificial. Furthermore, in the first soldier storyline of the mobile game Ever Crisis, whose initial chapters were released in the months prior to Rebirth's launch, 
a recurring topic is that young Sephiroth wishes to prove to his soldier comrades that he's not a cyborg. This Sephiroth, of course, is another silver-haired boy at the mercy of Hojo. One of the subjects I cover in my book, Norse Myths That Inspired Final Fantasy VII, is the true name of the Midgar Zolom, a giant python in the old game that dwells in the marshes. The original Japanese name for the fiend was Midgard Sommer, which has now been corrected in the localization of Rebirth. In Norse mythology, Midgard Sommer is the colossal world serpent that lives in the ocean, encircling the known world, Midgard, by biting its own tail. It's foretold that one of the heralds of Ragnarok, the Norse apocalypse when the universe will be engulfed by fire, is that Midgard Sommer will let go of his tail and make his way to land filling the air and sea with poison. At the final battle between the gods and the armies of Chaos, Midgard Sommer will engage the storm god Thor and they will kill each other. If you ask Bill about the monster while at the ranch, he describes it as being longer than a river, quieter than a whisper and quicker than a lightning bolt. Given that Thor is the deity responsible for thunder and lightning, this last line is a likely nod to Viking lore and the illusions certainly don't end there. As the party is crossing the swamplands on Chocobo back, they quite literally stumble upon Midgard Sommer. The fiend uncoils itself to rise from the water, just as the world serpent will at Ragnarok. During the battle, Midgard Sommer again wraps itself in a coil, eventually unleashing the attack Toxic Waters. As in mythology, the snake then proceeds to exhale poison, contaminating the swamp around it. Additionally, towards the end of the fight, it uses the signature move Beta, which sets the nearby trees ablaze. This reflects the apocalyptic climax of Ragnarok, a legend that's directly referenced time and again over the course of Rebirth. And finally, having Sephiroth appear beneath the swamp and impale Midgard Sommer on a tree certainly answers the question from the original Final Fantasy VII, did Sephiroth do this? Something the scene also reintroduces, however, is the deliberate ambiguity over which version of Sephiroth this is. Remake's Ultimania verifies that the player is shown four separate iterations of him in the game, and this seems to have been carried over into Rebirth. Already, we've encountered the real Sephiroth during the Nibelheim flashback. The Sephiroth includes Mind at the end of Chapter 1 when he casts doubt over Tifa's identity and the Sephiroth that can manifest from the robed figures through the illusionary powers of Genova, as previously depicted in Chapter 17 of Remake. It remains to be seen whether the one who saves Cloud in the swamp is the latter of these, or the transcendent Sephiroth that was fought in the singularity, although the manner in which he materialises here may provide a clue. Well guys, that's all for now. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I invite you to check out all future episodes on KubelCon's channel. If you're interested in the lore side of things, my own books Norse Myths That Inspired Final Fantasy VII and Greek Myths That Inspired Final Fantasy VII are both available on Amazon. As always, I'd especially like to thank all of KubelCon's Patreon subscribers for your continued support. Without your backing, productions such as this would not be possible. If you're not already a patron, please do consider joining for some incredible KubelCon exclusives. But for now, take care. I'm MJ Gallagher, and I'll speak to you again soon.